Hey, hey everyone. This is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here. Today I'm here with another CEO, uh, a company called Core. His name is Nimrod Priel. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy having product CEOs on the show. People who work in product before and eventually decided to build product in a different capacity. Um, we'll definitely be covering all of that. Like, I also want to get way back. So I was stalking your LinkedIn and I saw that your first job was in the military. So yeah. tell me a little bit more about that and how does someone who starts working in the military as a developer ends up breaking into product? Sure. So, yeah, I started out my career more than 20 years ago um, in Israel. Military service is mandatory. Um, like much of Israeli tech, I started in one of the computer units in, uh, in software engineering. Um, but I actually worked um, uh, slightly after that. I started working in machine learning long before it was, you know, AI and, and LLMs. It was still called machine learning and NLP. And around um, uh, somewhere like just over 10 years ago, I started a product role after the company that I worked for was acquired by Facebook. And at Facebook, um, I basically uh, ran this small subsidiary. We had a couple of apps in the App Store and in the Play Store and an internal tool that was, um, it's almost like B2B because it was an internal tool that was used by thousands of employees a month lots of others, P PMs and data scientists that was mainly aimed at the product leadership to kind of go and take a look quantitatively, understand different markets, understand how apps are used around the world by um, all kinds of people and make kind of, uh, uh, you know, their business case and hypothesis using that tool. Um, and when I left five years later, so that, that takes us to like uh, 2018, um, I started advising product people and, and teams at my friends' companies. So again, sort of a lot of Israeli tech started from uh, people who, whose careers started in these military units and, and they were friends of mine, but they started companies that ended up becoming multi-billion dollar companies or public companies in some cases, and not by any means through my advice. Um, but I was there along for the for the journey, just great companies and um, helping them kind of learn the playbook that Facebook had for how PMs work that I think is nowadays a bit more kind of widely spread and well known through things like the product school, but also, you know, other communities, other blogs and podcasts about product. But if you look back just, uh, you know, five, six years ago, that knowledge was pretty rare. Like it was pretty hard to yeah. find. You didn't have a, a clear sense of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, OKRs and the discovery journey and like the different um, uh, uh, roles that a PM carries in a company. People still thought PM was project manager, really. Yeah. Um, and so... It, it was kind of, I, I did that with them. There's a lot of learnings there, a lot of interesting things, just looking at different companies doing this. Uh, and then finally took the plunge and, and kind of started my own company that, that also uh, our main client is other PMs. And so I, I, I have the um, kind of true joy and benefit of just working with like my, my people all the time, just PMs of, of other companies, again, big and small. Um, and helping them make their products better through using our, our SDK. Where are you based now? So I'm in London now. Um, I'm originally from Israel, um, as you mentioned, but um, I, I lived in New York and, and studied and worked there for a couple of years at one of the startups, then moved to London 10 years ago. Yeah, so clearly there's no straight path into product or into starting a company. In your case, it's very really interesting. We started in the military and then I saw that you started first working as a software engineer. You mentioned that that company that you were working at as a software engineer got acquired by Facebook. Yes. So how did Facebook find about a company that is building something outside you know, you're used to a Silicon Valley or New York and decides yeah. to acquire that team. Yeah, I think, look, M&A is, is a fascinating topic and I, I'm actually not fully privy to all the like 
conversations that happened or how exactly did they know. Um, we were a Sequoia-backed company, and uh, obviously uh, Facebook is a Sequoia-backed company, and there might have been some uh, money through that. Yeah, we were clients of ours. So a lot of acquisitions often happen through um, some strategic clients that are already kind of loving the product, loving the team. And in our case, that was, uh, we, we also, you know, kind of that company was in the market intelligence uh, sort of market. So companies like Comscore or Nielsen, where, you know, PMs might go to look for um, uh, kind of quantitative data about the, the market they work in, right? If they want to see like how many, you know, how much traffic their competitors get or uh, just kind of understand a market they want to go to. Um, so we were part of that, but for apps, kind of like an app Annie. And we had, again, sort of the uh, kind of nice, very enjoyable experience for me personally of working with the product and, and the um, executive teams of the top apps in the app store back in the time. So some of these apps don't exist anymore, right? But we we did have uh, Facebook and uh, Google and uh, Zynga and Disney and, and all kinds of uh, companies like that as clients. And we got to kind of work with them, partner with them, show them how to use the data and so on. Mm -hmm. And I see that you first joined Facebook post acquisition, not as a PM, but as a research scientist manager, right? Yeah. So I like to say about like what was your understanding of product at that point? Yeah, I you know I kind of I like to say that somehow in my career I tried to kind of catch them all. I tried to like play every <laughs> role conceivable in in tech. So I started out as an engineer. Um, at some point, again, kind of moving to machine learning and um, in. Uh, that company in Onavo, I was actually a data scientist. And so when we were acquired, um, and actually throughout my time at Facebook, I, I did two roles. I um, managed this team of research scientists, uh, people um, mostly with uh, PhDs and postdocs that dealt with like kind of deep data analysis and statistics and so on. Um, and more a bit more than half my time was devoted to building these internal apps. And it's funny, some people who meet me from back then know me as Nimrod, the PM of Onavo, and others know me as Nimrod, the research manager of this core data science yeah. team. And I just kind of just went for it and did these two things before we had kids and stuff. And I just work all day and <laughs> held these two roles. Um, yeah, I hear you. And, yeah. and you mentioned that obviously you join a large organization like Facebook, especially such an incredible product-led organization, uh, you, you also acquire some of the best practices. And, and that gave you then the opportunity to apply some of that outside Facebook. I think, and I resonate with you because when I started my company, Product School, I've been also fortunate to work in different places before and, and see how some incredible professionals build data products, but that knowledge seemed to be encapsulated in, in companies. And... Uh, now seeing more product leaders like yourself who are building, who are also spreading that knowledge. I think it's helping the entire industry to be a little bit more standardized. Like there are yeah. certain playbooks and certain good practices that now can be applied regardless of your company. Obviously, you want to adjust to your specific context, but tell me a little bit more about what are some of those best practices that, that you acquired there, uh, your time working as a team at Facebook. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think, you know, kind of Nimrod, the advisor, um, kind of fig figured out, found out after a couple of years that actually I just can't continue kind of doing the advisory work because all of the knowledge is out there and I feel bad taking kind of money to tell people just go to like, you know, product school or reforge or Lenny's you know newsletter and, and once that stuff really kind of kicked into gear and was becoming prevalent and so on it was kind of um, you know it was no longer uh, kind of unique knowledge and I don't think I really invented anything big there's here and there some stuff that I think I kind of crystallized really well and I can put my name behind it but mostly I'm just a very good sponge of other people's kinds of frameworks and ideas and um, 
And as a PM, there was a long list of advice that was shared around from a, a specific legendary PM that was uh, very early on at Facebook. It was a messenger at the time uh, that, that I joined um, that had like 60 or so tips. And they were passed along like the, the sort of, you know, that was the Bible of how to PM and uh, at Facebook. And, and some of them were very, very specific. Like they were kind of teaching you how to like present ideas, you know, kind of like the, the today people talk a lot about the Minto pyramid or bank consulting groups. Um, so uh, uh, the kind of ideas on how to create presentations, how to write. So some of them were about that, just communication, which is like a very basic tenet of, of being a very good PM, right? Is like clear communication. Um, there's a way that I really liked uh, to turn every decision, you know, as PMs, like a lot of what we do is just decision making. You know, there's like this uncertainty. There's like a few paths to go down, a few features maybe we like to implement, what should we prioritize, etc. cetera. Um, and we had this way to like turn it into a table, simple table with like, um, uh, you know, kind of consistent uh, the decision criteria. You'd always make the color green for good and red for bad. And you'd like sort the columns, the, the decision criteria by the importance. So the most important one is the first column, then the second column and so on. And the options were in rows. And it kind of like, as you do this, it forced, the point is to force you to think this way about the problem and to think thoroughly and you almost get to the to the solution the discussion like almost doesn't need to happen because you sorted it and organized it this way and it's very clear that the, like the top row has the most green stuff on the the left hand side it's really a presentation of information that kind of pulls out the right answer out of it um but the discussion is suddenly very structured so it ranged from like these kind of very um i don't know like specific uh, ideas to some more kind of mental frameworks and structures and processes and um, like, you know, ideas like the fact that um, uh, negotiation, whenever you have a negotiation, either with another party or kind of within, uh, you know, two orgs that are trying to find a solution to work together, um, the real job in negotiation is not how to kind of wrestle someone with your words and get him to like agree, but it's actually just finding a BATNA, a best alternative to a negotiated agreement, just finding a, you know, all the options that you have, and that is the work. And then everything else is like less important because once you've found all these options, you just, you arrive at the, at the kind of maximum that you can yeah. achieve there. I, um, I resonate with, with that. And I remember when I was starting my career as a product manager, a lot of the things I was trying to learn were mostly tactical, like the hard skills to create a roadmap, to define the right metrics, to create a prototype, to interview customers to get their input, like a lot of these different things that are critical. But as I also grew in my career as a, as a people leader, I realized that biggest problems or opportunities are actually people related more than product related. And what you mentioned around like negotiating or communicating with others and really creating that type of connection. It's critical. And I went to business school and I had so many other classes there, but in reality, I think I wasn't paying enough attention. I wasn't mentally ready to acquire this type of knowledge. And there's something magical that happens when you are in a situation where you actually have to figure it out. There's no way around it. Like you need to find this type of agreements with your peers in order to move forward. So um, I also want to learn more about like how were you able to continue learning? Like you acquired a playbook, some guidelines, some of them were, some didn't, but like, was there any mentor, advisor, training or something that you were also doing to, to help you grow? Yeah, I think I was lucky to find a whole lot of people um, along the way and kind of, pick up stuff from everyone. The list is so long, but I, I was just, I think, you know, I talked with a lot of people, interviewing people, asking them why they left their companies and stuff like that. And I think it's kind of a, um, a bit of a coin toss. It's really hard to tell whether you'll have a good manager or a bad manager. And I think I, I like lucked out with the coin toss 
and um, you know, pretty much have had just great managers in my entire career. Um, and some of them, you know, went on to be great successes. They were founders of companies who, uh, again, got acquired and now are like, you know, very senior people at Facebook and so on. Um, and I, I was kind of just there to soak up what I could from them. Uh, and then later was investors, right? So again, as a, as a CEO founder, I work a lot with my investors. Some of them have started multi-billion dollar businesses. Some of them are like just well-known VCs that are sitting in the boards of some of the you know, uh, bigger, well-known public companies, you know, we have Index, I'm very lucky, Jan Hammer is our investor, also invested in um, Revolut and Robinhood and um, Product Board, you know, and some excellent yeah. companies, and he's uh, sharing all the advice from there. Uh, the, the list is very long. We can end, <laughs> and I can do credits and thank yous for the rest of the <laughs> of the There pod. are a couple of uh, um, patterns that I identify here. One is, uh, sure, you might have been lucky in some coin tosses, but you were there. You know, you were flipping the coin. Like I think you put yourself in a position to at least have the opportunity and you work hard. And I think there is no replacement for it. You might still not be lucky, but like you are maximizing your chances. Then the other piece and, and it's kind of the evolution after being a PM at Facebook, I see you were an advisor and as well as an investor. There's something powerful. I always say that teaching is the ultimate learning. So when you need to be in a position to help others, as an official instructor or advisor or mentor, however we want to call it, but like you need to know what you are talking about. And if you are even going to put your money where your mouth is and also be an investor, you are also need to fully understand what you are doing. So I can imagine that those two experiences, like I want to learn more about like how that, that also helped you become a better um, product CEO or, or, or leader. Yeah, so I think it goes back to something that you started asking, and I, I kind of started answering, and then I kind of moved on to something else. But like, I I always had this hunger, this kind of um, internal sense that like, oh, I'm an engineer, I'm actually building the you know the the software, the product, but but what are what are these guys doing all day long? Like, what what is going on in the like product discussions or CEO discussions and. Um, and, and at some point, again, sort of data science and then kind of really wanted to be a PM and kind of leaped on the opportunity to do it, kind of just was there and saying yes whenever uh, I could. And the one thing, you know, I could take credit for is like, yeah, I, I worked hard. I always did a couple of things at once. I um, worked full time throughout my bachelor's. I worked full time throughout my master's degree. I, I then at Facebook had this two roles. Um, now that's no longer the case. I'm just like a, a startup <laughs> founder and a dad. That's it. I can't. That's I can't Those parallelize. Two roles as well. Yeah, it's a lot of work, um, as you know. But um, uh, but basically, always try. And and I think through C CEO kind of gave me the real sort of sense of like, okay, well, as a CEO, you just have to. You have to like learn from your marketer, learn from your salesperson. Because I never I never did sales, but we do B two B sales now, and I learned it all on the job from advisors and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. I feel like, wow, I'm like learning, I'm learning what do admins do, <laughs> you know, and, and they like have a very complicated job learning finance, stuff like that through that because I didn't do MBA. Um, but the investing stuff came about because um, a friend started a startup and we were very close. He was um, also a PM at Facebook that I learned a ton from and I really appreciate also a successful founder that existed and started a new, a new startup. And he said, look, I'm gathering some friends. Do you want to um, uh, you know, put in some money? And I never did this before. I never thought of it as a thing that I could do. Uh, and I told my wife, this is like a very, very expensive tuition. I'm doing this because maybe one day I want to start a startup and this will give me like the front ticket seats and how it starts, you know? Um, and so I did this, uh, but after I did it, it kind of, you, you sort of, once you start, doing an angel investment, you you get to talk to all the other kind of angel investors and you suddenly get invited into more deals because you were an angel investor in this deal. So maybe you should, you know, maybe you're, you're up for investing in, and uh, let's just say it's a very expensive hobby <laughs> um, that kind of, uh, uh, I was again, sort of very fortunate and I, I could yeah. manage to do it because of the successes at Facebook. Um, put us in a very good place. Um, but I was, you know, just very happy and excited to support all kinds of founders, first time founders coming from like, 
you know, not coming from tech, not coming really from this industry. Some of them, we sold the company to Miro, the, the whiteboard company, um, two years ago. It was, you know, great success. And so suddenly, once you kind of see the whole journey, you feel a bit more comfortable. So I'm not actively angel investing. Like, I don't have time for this. I, I'm mostly focusing on, on Cord. Um, but, I, but I have done, you know, sort of 12 or 15 kind of deals uh, over the last uh, five, six years. But let's talk about Cord. Um, tell us more about what you, what, what are you building? Sure. So, yeah. So, um, look, very shortly, because I don't want to make this into a sales pitch or anything. Um, what we do is, um, you know, a lot of products like Notion and Figma and um, uh, you can give a lot of other examples that uh, folks here obviously um, love because they're the modern sort of productivity stack. Um, what characterizes them, what made them very successful with the Figma story, it's just fascinating. They grew from like um, 8% of the market to 58% of the market from a $40 billion market that had like very stable incumbents that people knew like Sketch and Envision, um, mainly through becoming multiplayer, through, through having collaboration as a sort of first class kind of feature in the app. Um, and we believe that that's where the world is going, that most apps will have collaboration in context because it's just better than command tabbing into Slack and copying and pasting screenshots and links and whatever. And we provide the features, the, the infrastructure and the components that you can put in your app. Um, and so from apps like our you know, products from companies like monday.com or bill.com or uh, ThoughtSpot, which is a big BI tool that some people here might use in their companies, we're adding the, the commenting features are powered by Cord. So all kinds of examples um, in crypto and little big apps, finance tools, all kinds of stuff. So give me uh, one of those examples. So when you talk about commenting, like what is a use case for a product manager? Yeah, so look, um, as a product manager for a B2B SaaS, you might want to add commenting to your um, B2B SaaS tool because your users would benefit from it. They benefit from it because what happens is if they have to um, rely on either Slack or email, um, so sometimes it's, it's Slack if it's a team working together in a product like Figma or Notion, but sometimes some products bring in multiple parties together to work inside of this you know, SaaS tool. So for example, one of our clients, Trumpet, is a, um, it's a, a, like a tool for salespeople to build microsites. So instead of sending a deck, they send this like microsite to their prospect. And so the salesperson, the prospect can talk about the offer and the details of, of the, you know, uh, kind of solution that they're selling on this site. Um, and this is way better than email. A, it's like you can do all the things that we're just used to doing from the modern kind of communication tools like WhatsApp and, and um, uh, you know, Slack and so on. Like we can add mention people, drag and drop files inside, use Markdown, edit and delete messages, see whether a person saw the message or not, just like the real live typing indicators, all that rich functionality that people just come to expect from chat um, is you, you can add it to any product, right? right. Uh, so that's very useful for all kinds of products. And the reason it's useful for products is because it's useful for the users. It's useful for the users, just like in Figma and Google Docs, you never take screenshots and copy and paste links, commenting in line, in context on a specific line, or we have, um, clients that are video editing tools. And so you want to comment on a specific kind of timestamp in the video and have the, when you click the comment, it scrolls the video to the right place. All that stuff that lets the comments stay in context, enrich the, the thing that they're talking about, let everyone reply there, but still get notifications and email and Slack and so on. A lot of work to build yourself. And just like you don't build your login yourself, you use like Auth0 or any of the other kind of uh, sort of solutions for login, uh, we believe that commenting is a waste of time to build yourself and you should just kind of go to yeah, the so best in class solutions. Similar to how we were discussing that there are playbooks out there, specific frameworks and, and tools that uh, people can repurpose. I think this, that these particular use cases can also be repurposed across across companies, across products. Like there's no need, as you mentioned, right, to reinvent the wheel now. And if you're trying to build a new website, 
figure out how to create a new login system. There's like yeah. a block that exists exactly. that you can just embed, similar to a Lego. I think of these digital products in a way as, as Lego puzzles, where there are some unique pieces that you still want to build. Hopefully those are the pieces that add the differentiating value, but then there are other pieces that are more standard that can save you a lot of time and, and don't really add much more differentiating values. So it's probably better to buy than, than to build. And I've seen this evolution happen uh, where software engineers would roll up their sleeves and say, no, no, everything is unique. So we need to build everything from scratch. Right? And now in engineering, there are all kinds of frameworks, libraries and repositories that allow engineers to move faster. So curious to know, how did you figure out that this Lego block that you are building in a way, like this, this collaborating platform is going to become a standard for other, other products out there? So I'll tell you what, instead of talking about Cord, I'll give a different example, a story that I just like, and it, it just, it analogizes and it connects to Cord, but I think it'll be more interesting for everyone. It'll answer the question regardless. So the story is the story of the like button. So the like reaction, the like button that we see everywhere, we, you know, I hope that people still know this was like invented at Facebook, um, but by now it's like so common, it's everywhere, you sort of forget where it started. And the reason it started at Facebook was um, there, there used to be, you used to post, there wasn't a feed, you would post things to your wall and people's walls, that, that was the posts, and then there were comments below. And a lot of the comment, a lot of people would post like, I don't know, life updates or whatever. And a lot of the comments were people trying to like, you know, affirm what they did and, and sort of go, oh, cool, awesome, great to hear, you know. What happens with that is that you get lots of comments, but um, they're mostly boring. They're mostly just like kind of, you know, just affirmation that's not really interesting. And it's hard to fish out what the interesting content is. Like if someone had a reply that's meaningful, it's like buried under a lot of like thank yous, plus ones, whatever. Um, and uh, the other thing that's hard is like kind of when you want to comment on something, like you keep seeing these posts and you keep having to come up with new ways to just say awesome, awesome. Uh, otherwise you're like the awesome guy who just copies and pastes awesome everywhere, right? Um, so you kind of, it's, it makes it harder for me, even if I want to like give you credit for something you did, it makes it harder for me to do it. And that was the key realization that led to developing the like button. And one of um, uh, kind of the person who's close to us, advised us before, a um, person named Soleo Cuervo was a designer who came up with the idea for the like button at Facebook. Um, it was very counterintuitive because it tanks a lot of the metrics, right? Like you had a lot of comments and they're all gonna go away because they're gonna be replaced with people clicking the like button. But it actually helps because people can see more interesting comments rather than being stuck on that like moment that has a lot of mental kind of, um, uh, you know, friction, mental load of coming up with a new way to express the idea of, um, you know, confirmation. And so they launched this and it goes ballistic, right? And a ton of likes everywhere and everyone uses it. And then Facebook was actually a huge laggard and took them a long time to develop a, a broader swathe of reaction. So everyone took this comment, th this like idea, but, um, you know, fast forward, a few different apps tried like a like unlike mechanism. And then um, I think Slack was actually the first one that I remember, maybe people know this uh, differently, um, that came up with this like, okay, you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be just a like, it could be a whole set of emojis. And then actually Facebook did the whole like smile, you know, this five emojis. And I think Facebook today has already switched to like any reaction in, in um, some of their products, at least Messenger for sure. Um, and so the thing that's interesting in this is that there was this like innovation and in product that became just um, uh, uh, changed like the world of product for everyone, like outside the company that it was made up in, it was copied over and now it's just a part and parcel of how we kind of uh, uh, look at, uh, you know, commenting, there must be a reaction to save us time from saying awesome or whatever. So I know we have to wrap up. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll finish with this. I just noticed that there's, there are these patterns around communication. You know, the best in class communication looks like WhatsApp. And if you implement it or Telegram or Slack, whatever your favorite kind of cutting edge 
messaging tool is, but they all share a very broad swathe of capabilities. And if you implement it from scratch, that's a ton of work and you end up with something that's so backwards that people don't want to use it. So that was the realization that there's this pattern here. This is something that is just, everyone will want to have it as good as, you know, Figma and Notion and, and, and WhatsApp and so on. And that was so, what we crystallized. Uh, thank you, I love the story. And uh, brought me back to the days when I was literally picking the, the like button and that's kind of the evolution of the emojis today and, and stickers and a fun, bunch of other ways to express emotions while still ensuring the quality of the comments. Um, yep. uh, you made me think about now how Slack or other communication tools in the workplace are, could potentially evolve into providing those conversations with the context. It was like a lot of these conversations you mentioned happen outside your current company. You need to collaborate with other partners, vendors, clients, you name it. And you're going back to email sounds a little bit like old school, not very productive. So moving forward, putting them both in the context of like the product or the whatever they are trying to discuss allows them to not just chat or express emojis, but to actually interact and, and, and do more, more things beyond just text. Yes. yes, fully agree. I think, you know, we talk about um, uh, kind of communication versus collaboration. So like, imagine trying to build an, a piece of Ikea furniture, but um, over the phone, right? So you don't see your friend, you have to like give them the instructions and you can only talk to them over the phone. Um, this is like, it's, it's, it's just very, very hard. Like you wanna be there and be able to point at stuff. Um, and this is what communication in context lets us do. It lets us like highlight a piece of text, highlight a point on a chart, highlight a, you know, a, a kind of frame in a video and say, well, this should be more well lit or whatever it is, right? Uh, and so we have all of these use cases and they, you know, kind of, there's all kinds of innovations. I could talk about it for hours. I don't want to turn this again. So the, the maybe sales you can pitch. give us a, a glimpse into the future. It's like, maybe people can think, well, when we have a video call over Zoom or any other tool, right, this can share the screen. I know it's not the most collaborative experience because you can still build a lot of things on top of that screen share, but you know, it's a, it's a step forward. So if you were to think in terms of collaboration the next three years, like what is that next frontier? Yeah, I think, look, um, in three years time, I think there's still a lot of catch up for a lot of tools to do because most of, you know, except if you're in like a, a very small set, I used to speak to investors about this and I said, like, you know, investors basically live their days in email and, and Google Docs. Um, uh, and or Word. Uh, and so they don't really have a sense of kind of the tools that most people use. But if you're a DevOps engineer, you might be using Grafana and like some AWS kind of, uh, you know, consoles and, and maybe um, uh, some other logging tools. And none of these have collaboration. Like you end up having to go back to something like Slack to kind of follow along on an incident or, or share the info. So I think it would be amazing if we have the world where all of these tools, and same goes for marketers, you know, even the modern kind of uh, marketing tools that most people use to create newsletters or whatever, you actually can't collaborate inside them. You can't kind of, again, sort of work together, but you do need all of these people. You need feedback, approval, passing on the baton, you know, from the like content copywriter to the uh, designer to kind of add in the images and then um, uh, maybe someone approves it or someone does the links or uh, whatever your workflow is, it very likely involves a few people. Um, and that's that's where the gap is if we have to jump. So in a three year time frame, I'm just imagining all of these tools getting collaboration at the level of like Figma, which involves a lot of details on notifications, on kind of um, being able to follow someone along and so on. If you ask me about the longer time frame, I'm kind of excited about where the next um, a leap in interfaces will be. And um, if, if I learned anything from the last 20 years is that you look at consumer tech first and that's where, that's where business tech will go. So, you know, stuff that was 
thought of um, as like wild, like not using chat and not email and work was completely wild in like 2005. It was like you couldn't imagine. Um, it's it just it, it was like chat was ICQ was for kids, you know, um, or uh, using even uh, you know emojis and like just using emojis in like a business or, or like in a professional correspondence was like weird um, and and using lights and using, you know, and, and now I have business chats on WhatsApp, you know, and um, things that we've seen, you know, like Loom has opened up this idea of taking a video of ourselves and sending it over, which again, it's kind of people w- were used to it from the uh, WhatsApp experience from their like B2C experiences from stuff like Snapchat. And it takes a few years, it lags, but then it gets into work. So I think we will see the stuff that we see in B2C today and maybe it's streaming and maybe it's um, stuff like VR um, that, that, you know, kind of today is very cumbersome and hard to imagine, but I think if you look 10 years ahead, it might be that. It will be amazingly exciting to build the collaboration layer for that. So we'll see. Nimrod, it was a pleasure to learn more about your experience growing as a product leader, as well as your experience now as a CEO building the future of collaboration. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks for having me.